Tonight, we're tracking a major storm. Blizzard conditions poised to make travel home for the holiday a mess. The Weather Service warning the combination of snow and whiteout conditions will make travel difficult to impossible in some areas. Millions under winter weather alerts, more than 100 winter-related accidents in Nebraska alone, we're tracking it all. President Biden ordering airstrikes in Iraq in retaliation for a drone attack that wounded three American service members, one of them critically. The latest hostilities involving Iran-backed militants. While in Gaza, intense new bombing by Israel, dozens killed, and the possible terror attack near an Israeli embassy. Plus, our Richard Engel in the Israeli-occupied West Bank, where Palestinians face growing violence by Jewish settlers. The confrontation they caught on camera. Also tonight, Ukraine's cruise missile attack on a Russian warship, the moment of impact. The crisis at the border, thousands joining a new migrant caravan heading towards the U.S. Bus drivers under attack, the growing number being assaulted, punched, pepper sprayed, even threatened with a machete. Can anything be done to protect them? The latest version of the Apple Watch, no longer for sale here. The reason why. And music gave him hope and still does. Powerful echoes of the past with the Holocaust Survivor Band. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. And good evening. I'm Tom Yamas, in for Lester. We want to begin tonight with that big winter storm moving across the country with six million people under winter weather alerts, including blizzard and ice warnings. The sprawling storm bringing blizzard conditions and heavy rain to millions traveling home for the holidays. Stretches of major interstates closed. Nebraska Highway State Patrol responding to get this 150 accidents on Christmas alone. Colorado, Kansas, the Dakotas, and Nebraska are in its grip. Snow, ice, and strong winds making travel challenging for some tonight. This same system is stretching all the way to the east where there's lots of rain in the forecast. So let's get right over to NBC meteorologist Michelle Grossman, who is tracking it all for us tonight. Michelle, what can we expect? Tom, we can expect a lot. We're looking at heavy snow, blizzard conditions in the plains. We're also looking at freezing rain and a lot of rain moving throughout the northeast by tomorrow. Six million people under winter alerts. We have winter weather advisories, winter storm warnings, ice storm warnings, and also blizzard warnings throughout the plains where you see that dark purple color. And we're looking at really dangerous conditions there. Also the chance of some blowing snow. This is what it looks like on radar. The pink is that freezing rain. Really dangerous conditions. Be careful as you head out. The blue is the snow. And look at all this rain extending down to parts of the southeast. Some of it will be locally flooding. So be careful as you head out, especially tomorrow into Thursday. This is what tomorrow looks like. We're looking at that storm system moving off to the north, bringing a soaking rain to the northeast. Tom? All right, Michelle, we'll stay tracking it all. Now to the Middle East and the volatile situation unfolding there. Today, U.S. forces across the region came under militia fire after President Biden approved deadly strikes last night on an Iranian-backed group in Iraq. Courtney Cuby has the late-breaking details tonight. <laughs> Tensions flaring in Iraq as the U.S. conducted precision airstrikes against three facilities used by Iranian-backed militias. The U.S. military saying they killed multiple fighters. Defense officials sending a clear message to militia groups and to Iran. The U.S. strikes in retaliation for an attack on Erbil Air Base in Iraq on Christmas Day. U.S. officials say militants launched an attack drone that struck the base, injuring three U.S. troops, one in critical but now stable condition and being transferred to Landstuhl. In a statement, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said these precision strikes are a response to a series of attacks against U.S. personnel in Iraq and Syria. There have been at least 105 attacks against bases with Americans in Iraq and Syria over the past two months, causing minor injuries. These incidents have dramatically increased since the October 7th Hamas attack against Israel, rousing Iranian-backed militia groups throughout the region, including the Houthi rebels in Yemen who have assaulted commercial ships. Just today, U.S. forces shot down a dozen one-way attack drones as well as ballistic and land attack cruise missiles fired by the Houthis in the Red Sea region, according to U.S. Central Command. While traveling in Israel last week, Secretary Austin warned of an expanding regional conflict. Iran is raising tensions by continuing to support terrorist groups and militias. Attacks by these Iranian proxies threaten the region's citizens and risk a broader conflict. 
Courtney joins us tonight live from the Pentagon. And there's a new warning from an international watchdog group about Iran's nuclear program. Yeah, that's right, Tom. The International Atomic Energy Agency says Iran has sped up production of highly enriched uranium. Now, that's the material used to produce a nuclear bomb. Production slowed earlier this year while the U.S. and Iran negotiated the release of hostages. Tom? Courtney Kuby with that new reporting tonight. Courtney, thank you. Let's head to Israel now. A new warning from the military chief that the war against Hamas will not end anytime soon. Today, the war's toll came into stark view as Israel steps up its bombing in a side of Gaza. Josh Letterman has more. Tonight, as Israel warns the war with Hamas will go on for many more months, the world is getting a closer look at the scope of destruction wrought by more than 80 days of war. Israel's military saying it's expanding operations in the refugee camps of central Gaza, where the Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry says at least 70 were killed on Christmas Eve. And in southern Gaza, where today volunteers carried out a grim task in Gaza's sandy earth. They dug a mass grave and laid to rest 80 Palestinians. Whether they were Hamas terrorists, innocent civilians, or a mix of both is unknown. But each shiny blue bag is a life cut short. The bodies collected by Israeli forces during the ground war and returned today to Gaza. Just 25 miles north, this is what's left of Beit Hanun the first city bombed when Israel began retaliating for Hamas's October 7th terror attacks. This video was shot from a horse-drawn cart, showing an endless wasteland. Mohammed's mom was killed when their house was bombed. His dad is missing. At 13, the lives of his seven siblings are now in his hands. I don't know how to deal with this, he says, but I know how to make my sister's milk. I change her. She hardly drinks the milk. Despite intense global pressure to scale back the war, Prime Minister Netanyahu is vowing to stay the course. His military chief of staff saying there are no shortcuts to dismantling a terrorist group. But the U.S. and Israel are at odds over whether Israel should control Gaza security indefinitely. Tonight, a top Netanyahu advisor is in Washington for meetings with top U.S. officials, working to hammer out those differences with Israel's closest ally. All right, Josh Letterman joins us tonight from Tel Aviv. Josh, there was an explosion near Israel's embassy in New Delhi. What do we know about that? Well, Israel's National Security Council says it was a potential terror attack. And while no one was injured, with tensions so high over this war globally, Israel is warning its citizens to be on high alert. Tom? All right, Josh, thank you for that. Now to the war in Ukraine, where that country's military says it launched a cruise missile attack that destroyed a large Russian warship at a port on the Black Sea. The moment of impact, you see it here in this video, taken in Russian-occupied Crimea. One person was reported killed. Back here at home to our south, where thousands of migrants have joined a caravan in Central America that's making its way to the U.S., it comes as Secretary of State Antony Blinken prepares to visit Mexico's capital tomorrow. Morgan Chesky reports from the border. Tonight in southern Mexico, a new migrant caravan is heading north. A group of men, women and children whose organizers say is now 8,000 strong after an estimated 2,000 more joined in a single day. The caravan last seen in the Mexican state of Chiapas near Guatemala would be the largest since last year. Many of them desperate and exhausted. This father from Honduras sharing his three-year-old daughter is now too weak to walk. The U.S. border still more than a thousand miles away. In Eagle Pass, Texas, just days after these stunning scenes of migrant families lining the Rio Grande, tonight U.S. Customs and Border Protection facing a quiet lull that likely won't last long. Outside an Eagle Pass shelter, we met Osmani Marian and Edison. Donde van ahora? Where are you going now? Oklahoma. Oklahoma? Los Angeles. L.A.? Dallas. Dallas. Oh, Marianne oh, from yeah. Venezuela says oh, she's yeah. now waiting until her asylum hearing. Oh. After a five-month journey here, she called dangerous but worth it. Estados Unidos, Mexico's president now saying he'll meet with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken tomorrow in Mexico City to discuss potential joint solutions. Texas Governor Greg Abbott taking his own steps, installing more barbed wire on the border and busing more migrants to primarily Democratic-led cities such as Chicago and New York, both now buckling under rising numbers. Governor Abbott has made it clear he wants to destabilize cities and send thousands of migrants and asylum seekers. 
Tonight, as that migrant caravan makes its way north, lawmakers in Washington still need to strike a deal over southern border policy. But as of right now, there is no clear agreement. Tom. Morgan Chesky on the border for us tonight. Morgan, thank you. In 60 seconds, bus drivers under assault, the surge in attacks and growing fears, and what some cities are doing to keep drivers safe. Stay with us. We're back now with Apple pulling its most advanced smartwatches from American shelves. It comes after the Biden administration didn't overrule an international ban. Now Apple has filed an emergency request today to end that ban. A medical monitoring tech company accused Apple of hiring away its employees and stealing its technology to make the new Apple watches. All right, we want to turn now to an alarming and violent trend. Bus drivers coming under attack. The Federal Transit Administration is now taking national action to address the assaults. Candace Wynn with our NBC Bay Area station found one California system may be the most dangerous to work for in the country. From New York to California, they are essential to the public transit system. But the nation's bus drivers can also be sitting ducks facing a dramatic spike in violent attacks. According to the Federal Transit Administration, in recent years, there's been a 121% increase in transit worker assaults like this one. In July, gunfire shattered glass around this bus driver on Oakland, California's AC transit system, which according to the FTA's preliminary 2023 data, has the highest rate of assaults on transit workers in the country. Something AC Transit bus driver Tina Gonzalez knows all too well. Got hit across my face, punched about seven or eight times. Blacked out, got punched, woke up from it. This was not the only time you've been attacked. I've been attacked four other times. I will call the cops. Surveillance cameras show a 2017 assault on Gonzalez. She says the attacks now are more frequent and more violent. Have you ever feared for your life? When a kid pulled a gun on me. My supervisor told me one time was, just remember, you're the only one on that bus that probably doesn't have a gun. It scares the living hell out of me. AC Transit declined an interview but said in an email 2023 data is still being collected. The agency said it had a broader definition of assault than other systems, but that one act of violence is too many and it's adding better protective barriers for drivers. Public records requests for bus surveillance videos show what other California Bay Area drivers are facing. Violent attacks, pepper spray assaults, and even a kidnapping by a passenger with a machete. What are real solutions you want as an operator? A better shield. Not these fake shields that AC Transit made. Something that, like, New York has. They have those boxed in. This is what most AC Transit buses that we've been seeing have right now. These partial plastic barriers. As for New York, they're testing out these fully enclosed compartments. Both local and national transit leaders tell me they're keeping an eye out on those prototypes to see what they can learn. My top priority is to redesign the bus. John Costa is the president of the Amalgamated Transit Union, representing operators across the U.S. There's more stabbings going on. It's horrible. I mean, I have grown adults come in my office and cry. Costa is working with the FTA on new safety measures authorized under President Biden's 2021 infrastructure law. But with regulations still being written, he says the road to safety has been too slow for drivers like Gonzalez. I never missed a day at work. Now it's like scary to go to work. She now worries any day at work could be her last. Candace Wen, NBC News, Oakland, California. And we thank Candace for that. We're back in a moment with tensions in the West Bank as violence from Israeli settlers against Palestinians rises. What are Richard Engel and his team encounter? Next. We're back now with a closer look at heightened tensions in the occupied West Bank. As the Israeli Hamas war rages on miles away, Palestinians in the West Bank are facing more threats from Israeli settlers who seek to push them out. Richard Engel reports. 
The tiny Palestinian village of Atwani is in the West Bank, where shepherds still tend their flocks in scenes unchanged for centuries. Sami Hurani, whose family has lived here for generations, told me since Hamas's October 7th massacre, Jewish settlers have become far more aggressive in their long campaign to drive Palestinians from this land. And the idea is just to make your life so hard that you'll leave. To make the life unlivable, unsustainable, unsafe. Just at some point you will flew away from here. Sammy says the attackers come from Chabat Maon, a Jewish settlement built on occupied Palestinian land. The settlement is illegal under international and Israeli law. Now they have more and more authority and more and more protection to do what they want. That includes, he says, shooting at Palestinians. So if you were shot right now, there would be no consequences. No consequences. No one would ask. It didn't take long before we were noticed. There's a jeep coming toward us now. He was dressed like an Israeli soldier, but had no name tag or rank. You want us to leave? Yes. Okay. What's the problem? Stop the camera. Get in the car. Now. Okay. Get in the car. Now. Leave it. We are journalists. Get in the car. Now. He needs his, he needs Get his ID. Get in the car he needs, now. He needs his ID to go. Yes. Get in the car. Now. Okay. What do you think is going to happen now? I really don't know. Anything can happen. Now we will see. We left without further incident. <laughs> Sammy shared with us other videos, <laughs> appearing to show settlers attacking his neighbors. The Israeli government responded in a statement, saying in part it has zero tolerance for citizens taking the law into their own hands and that most of the so-called settlers are law-abiding citizens. The vast majority of violence that's committed by settlers goes absolutely um, undocumented, unaccounted for. Eliana Boswell is a Jewish-American activist documenting violence against Palestinians in the West Bank. Does the Israeli government support this movement? Absolutely. I think it's essential to understand that the settler movement and the Israeli government are deeply enmeshed and intertwined. The settlers are not hiding their goal of full Jewish control of the West Bank and Gaza Strip and believe October 7th was a turning point. Daniela Weiss is a leader of the settler movement. We are not going to give sovereignty, national independence to Arabs in the Jewish land. I make it as clear as possible. Enough is enough. No patience, no, no forgiveness, no consideration. Out. Deliberately expelling an entire people from their homeland yeah, yes. is a war crime. Because they deliberately killed my friends. They massacred my friends. And this is the way I react. I'm full with pain for my people. So I do not have room for other people. Richard Engel, NBC News, in the West Bank. When we come back, music helped him make it through the darkest of times. At 98, that passion took him all the way to the White House. Finally, a Holocaust survivor's incredible story about the power of music to unite people in their darkest moments. Here's Gabe Gutierrez. For 98-year-old Saul Dreyer in Florida, music is magic. Music keeps me alive. I don't have to eat. I don't have to drink. I want to make sure that what I do is perfect. Saul grew up in Poland and worked in Schindler's factory during the Holocaust. To this day, look at how vividly he remembers that time in a concentration camp when his fellow prisoners started singing and he joined in. I was singing with them. La, 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 la. That music kept him alive amid the horror. He lost around 25 family members, including his parents and sister. I don't know how I survived. But he did and lived a full life. A loving wife, four kids, eight grandchildren, three great-grandchildren. Just about perfect. Yet something was missing. Music. So despite some skepticism, he decided to live out his dream and form a Holocaust survivor band. Two people told me I'm crazy, my wife and my rabbi. But what's even crazier is that it worked. 
He's now played all around the country, even creating his own foundation. And earlier this month, another dream came true. At a Hanukkah reception, he played at the White House with the United States Marine Band. Here he is, meeting President Biden. I was crying in my, in my heart. What are you talking about? Impossible. This is a dream, more than a dream. I, I can't explain what it is. Perfection. Gabe Gutierrez, NBC News, the White House. He can still jam. We thank Gabe for that story. That's nightly news for this Tuesday. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tom Yamas. For all of us here at NBC News, have a great day. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.